the panel is titled Investing the Business of the Cloud, uh, and there are really sort of two parts to that that I want to see whether we can cover a little bit. Uh, one is um, cloud services themselves uh, and investing in those, uh, but then maybe even more importantly, what the existence of all these great cloud services means for the formation of new startups and investing in startups. And it's a great panel here, and uh, rather than my introducing them, um, I'm going to ask uh, each one of them to introduce themselves quickly and uh, to get things going to also name their favorite cloud service, consumer or uh, business for that matter. And I, I'll, I'll say right up front that we're missing one. Oh, here he's coming, <laughs> flying Ooh. right in, in the just in the just-in-time portion of the cloud business. It's uh, an on-demand world. Yes, on-demand. It's on-demand. Speakers on-demand. So why don't I just hand it over to you? Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Aileen Lee, uh, and I have been a partner at Kleiner Perkins, a early and mid and late stage venture firm in Silicon Valley for about 13 years. And then this past year, I just kind of spun out uh, to, and raised my own independent seed fund, which is currently called Cowboy Ventures, and it's a $40 million seed focused fund. Oh, favorite oh, cloud my service. Favorite cloud service. I have so many. I, I was saying to Albert, I was like, what isn't a cloud service? Um, but I would say, I think Evernote is probably the cloud ser service that I'm most addicted to recently. Uh, howdy, Byron Dieter with Bessemer, uh, proud Twilio investor, and relevant to this discussion, my background, uh, I was a former cloud entrepreneur, so built up uh, and sold a cloud business in the early 2000s to IBM, went over there, uh, continued to build out the team for a little while, it's up to about 1,000 people now within IBM, uh, rolled over and I lead the cloud practice at Bessemer Venture Partners today. Uh, we have about 40 portfolio companies in the cloud world, um, a number of the recent exits and IPOs, things ranging from LinkedIn, which I think of as a cloud business, to more pure play SaaS companies like Cornerstone On Demand or Eloqua a few weeks ago or LifeLock uh, two weeks ago, I think, uh, Broadsoft, an early platform and service IPO relevant for the telephony space, um, as well as you know, years ago, seed investors in Skype, which I think is very relevant to the space and helped, drove a lot of our, uh, helped to drive a lot of our enthusiasm for this market. Uh, and then most, uh, I guess, favorite cloud service or most interesting cloud service, I'm going to have to pimp the portfolio. It's companies like SendGrid or Box or even LinkedIn and their new APIs. I'm just a big believer in the platform revolution and love the service enablement. I'm Naval, uh, founder of AngelList. Uh, I guess uh, favorite cloud service, uh, oh, my Twilio relationship, I missed investing in Twilio. Um, so <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm the knucklehead who gets to sit up here and gets invited to all the conferences and this is how I pay my penance. Uh, and they pay me one share per appearance, so it's going to be a long day. Uh, but uh, my favorite cloud service, obviously, Twilio is a great company. I love Yammer. I don't think we at AngelList could function without it. Um, I love HipDial, which you guys should check out. It's like a free pinless co conference calling service. Um, it's just very simple, and it's built on top of Twilio. Um, but there's an infinite number of great cloud services out there. And in fact, these days, if, if it's not a cloud service, I almost look at them sideways. Right. Like, why would it not be a cloud service? Sort of like, why would you not do it as a mobile app first? Um, so I guess I, I'm trying to figure out like what's not in, a, in the cloud these days, but I'll go with an old, oldie but goodie, uh, YouTube, which is where I spend most of my time. Uh, actually, the, uh, AngelList, I'll say AngelList is my favorite cloud service. There you go. I use that pretty much every day also. So, so y you guys sort of hinted at it that everything's a cloud service. If you see the word cloud on a pitch today, does that still even mean anything to you? No. It's like somebody saying, I'm doing mobile apps. Like, OK, yeah. I think that there is uh, one distinction, at least. Uh, there are probably many distinctions, but there's one that I think is subtle in people's minds, but is really there, which is that some of these things we're talking about are cloud infrastructure that do not directly interact with the end user, and you build on top of those, like AWS and Twilio. Uh, and some of them directly interact with the end user. Uh, pretty much everyone these days is going to stick everything in the cloud. It's a question of do you do it directly or do you go through a box or an AWS or a Twilio to do it? Yeah, it, valid point. It's the double click. Where in the stack do you sit and simplify it? We think of it as one extra layer in there in the middle of the platform as a service, but it's really the infrastructure layer of the platform or the SaaS layer. And three years ago even, it was still heavily skewed towards SaaS and it was application-oriented development and then uh, really, we've started to see this wave now of platform companies that are leveraging the commoditization of the infrastructure layer to then provide the, the apps and services on top of that. Uh, as investors, we're still pretty paranoid about the infrastructure, pure infrastructure layer, uh, just because the big boys out there are doing all, us all a 
huge service and forward pricing and writing checks, uh, you know, with billions of dollars involved to build out these massive data centers and scale it, which our companies are benefiting from, but we're pretty reluctant to compete head to head with them, even though we're a $4 billion venture capital firm and, and theoretically could try to pick off some markets. Uh, we just think there's a lot more opportunity in the two major buckets above that. Sorry, can, can you specify again what you think the two major buckets above that are? Sure, specifically software as a service and platform as a service, and then we subdivide those into you know, vertical and functional areas. But at the application stack, fundamentally, you're interfacing, logging in through a browser, a mobile client, et cetera, where you're, um, as an end user, touching the product, or the platform as a service layer, uh, such as Twilio, where it's a programmatic interface via API, et cetera. So when you see a pitch that's um, more at the infrastructure level, which we see a lot of pitches uh, at, um, you said one scary factor is sort of the big guys. Um, is there something in particular that you'd be looking for and say that would kind of make it interesting? Have any of you invested um, other, other than Byron in something that would sort of fall at the infrastructure level? And why? Other than Twilio. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, actually, Wise Investors in Twilio and SimGrid, uh, so, uh, but be a little bit earlier before. Uh, Gengo is another service that we're investors in that's uh, uh, language translation as a service out of Japan. Uh, actually, use crowdsourced language translators to do the work, but they provide an infrastructure layer for enterprise to outsource those tasks and push them out to the field. Um, yeah, I mean, that's probably, you know, most of what we do on the enterprise or infrastructure side is that type of thing. We don't do a lot there, um, but most of them are trying to be like infrastructure services that the rest of our portfolio companies use. Um, in fact, that was probably why we invested in Twilio and also SendGrid was just we, it was an easy checkpoint with the rest of the companies in the portfolio as to whether they would use it or not. Uh, and usually that's our reference point for most of the investments we make that are on the infrastructure side is would other companies in our portfolio use it. Yeah, dis distinction being there, I think in that case, uh, the application developers view Twilio as infrastructure. Twilio still runs on top of infrastructure as service providers. So in a, in a three-layer stack, I think of Twilio and SendGrid and, and Box as platform as a service. Box skews more into the application space. Twilio skews more into infrastructure in some cases. And it's a convenient slice of uh, infrastructure where it dips down there because everyone believes it's critical and yet for whatever reason, how the stack has been defined, no one's d pulled this into their stack directly yet. So this, it's this beautiful adjacency. But raw infrastructure services, I think of as storage and compute and a lot of the, you know, the core foundational blocks. And, and to be straightforward, we've made some of those investments, data center oriented technologies, you know, recent exits like an Indeca or a Vertica and big data space. There, there certainly are markets where cloud can't take over immediately. You will have licensed software, you will have on-prem deployments. Uh, you can't cloudify everything out of the gate. And as technologists and geeks at heart, we still fall in love with many of those models and many of those will have success, but it's not a all or nothing. Um, and certainly in terms of majority of dollars uh, and time spent, we're, we're very cloud focused on the top two layers. Yeah, I think you know the biggest impact as an investor is probably that a lot of things that previously would have taken a lot more CapEx and time yeah, so, can be built very quickly. So let's switch to that. Um, so uh, we can come back at the end towards the sort of more infrastructure uh, cloud service. But I want to switch to exactly what, what Dave was leading into, which is um, we now have these examples of companies literally getting created over a weekend. So uh, famously, GroupMe uh, was created at the TechCrunch Disrupt Hackathon in New York City. Um, on top of Twilio, launched, uh, got funded and exited to Skype all, I think, within the space of 12 months or something like that. So, uh, so the question to you guys um, is, you know, now that these powerful building blocks are available, you can you know, grab whatever, Stripe for payments, you know, Twilio for telephony, yada, yada, um, and you can create something quite powerful in the space of a weekend. What, what still defines a startup? I mean, what, what is it that the people who start new companies that are using all these elements, bringing them together, what, what should they be thinking about? So I think um, the differentiation has moved up in the stack, right? So in the late 90s, just mastering the hardware was kind of the trick, I think, of leading or getting to market was because you needed, you needed capital, so you needed to have a track record to be able to attract the capital. You needed to have hardcore engineers that could actually set up your data center, that could buy and manage the servers. You had like whole teams of people that were just in charge of making sure that servers were running. 
And so, you know, all of that has gone away. And I think the differentiation is increasingly in your business model, in kind of the pain point that you've identified or the delight that you're delivering to the customer, the design, the user interface. I'm not saying that the, the stuff underneath isn't hard or important, but I think that the barriers to entry are a lot lower for people being able to access these services. And so a lot of it is on the user, like who is your market, what's your business model, and how do people use your product? That is increasingly where the differentiation comes from. Yeah, my, my first web startup was on called Opinions back in 99, and we had to buy Sun servers and Oracle databases, and uh, there weren't even data centers at the time to really right. host out of. We had to run our own hosting farm, we had our own ops people, and right. write our own deployment scripts, and so we spent eight million bucks building a consumer service product, and then finding out, wow, do people want it? Um, and what's happening now is the leverage in the ecosystem is tremendous. You know, Archimedes said, give me a place to stand in the lever and I will move the earth. And, and leverage is the name of the game. And you used to only get leverage through capital or labor, but now you have, these, you have these code platforms where all this leverage is built in for you so you can launch a company on the weekend. The flip side though is everyone's launching a company on the weekend. There's far too many companies. And so uh, for an, uh, the bar in the market for what's successful, uh, what can stand out to a customer, uh, and what can show up in the app store in the top rankings and what an investor will pay attention to has gone way up. Uh, we see can, this can you, Dave just launched one right now, in fact. Yeah, there you go. He's <laughs> launched a, he launched an F-bomb on Twitter, but that's different. Um, we find like an, on AngelList, the bar constantly goes up. When we first started AngelList, you could get a web company funded with no traction. Three months later, you couldn't. Then you could get a mobile company funded pre-product. Three months later, you needed a product for your mobile company. Today, if you want your mobile company to get taken a look at by angel investors, not even by VCs, you need to have hundreds of thousands to millions of downloads and installs. And you need to be growing at 30, 40% a month because that's what bootstrap teams in Dave's Accelerator get to with 50K and a lot of flogging. Um, <laughs> mostly by Dave, he wheels the whip. Uh, but the bar in the market just continues to go up and up and up. And so as, as Twilio and Amazon giveth, uh, the investors taketh away. <laughs> So I, I think um, there's a big challenge I, as an investor. So if there's benefits and there's disadvantages, I think. Uh, and I would argue Byron has maybe more of a challenge here as a big investor, but he may say he's got plenty of opportunities on his plate. Um, so a, a lot of larger CapEx investments would not be appropriate for us as a small fund to jump into. I think Eileen probably has the same math there. Uh, and so previously when we looked at stuff that was you know, three to five million dollars to get to customer. Um, we probably weren't that interested in doing that type of stuff. That's um, much higher risk before we can tell whether our investment makes sense. Um, and so now that everything can be launched much faster and you're not paying for as much, you know, for servers or, or software or bandwidth, everything's pretty much pay as you go. Uh, either it's much less capital to get to a proof point, or we can wait until the proof point to invest, and that happens much more quickly. So when we say, hey, we're, we want to see functional prototype, whereas you know, 10 years ago that might have been three years, and five years ago that might have been one year, now it might be a weekend to a couple of months to get to functional prototype, and it's probably a bootstrappable amount of money for people. Um, so that's better. Uh, the flip side is there's lots more competition. And the other flip side is uh, easier to sell those companies at smaller dollars. So as an investor, I think you have to understand like, okay, is there competitive differentiation in what's being built on top of the plumbing and infrastructure? And also, what's the motivations of the entrepreneur? What's a reasonable exit or size for them? And does that match with fund uh, expectations so as well? Can, can we drill into that a little bit because you know, Aileen mentioned sort of differentiation and business model and market fit, and you mentioned differentiation. Um, but if I launch, you know, everybody can see what I'm doing. And so, you know, in many spaces now we see somebody launches and then there are five fast followers within two months and 25 within six months. And so how do you, how do you think about how companies can succeed in that kind of environment? Um, where you know you see, oh, it's this for that. Oh, that's a great idea. We should launch this for that. You know. Um. And by the way, in China, they have like 30 copies by next weekend <laughs> of this for now, that. It's it's very rare to see a copycat overtake the original leader as long as the original leader sticks with it, doesn't drop the ball. 
It's rare. No, it's you, sometimes they drop the ball. If they drop the ball, sure. But if you have a network effect going, you know what you're doing. You're dedicated on it. It's you rare to get over to you. Somebody just because they say they're first. No, no, not because they're first. Oh, wait, wait, we, we need to have two mics going yeah. here. Come on, come on. They, they, they give give that man a mic. Bullshit. There are plenty of people <laughs> who will overtake your first mover. If your only advantage is your first mover, fuck no, you. No, I'm it's not, not your only advantage. But you have to. You have to have some traction. You have to be credible. You have to stick with it. Um, and okay. You well, well, let me just. Repeat. But not well, everybody well, well, has well, network effects that are not going to be overtaken by other people. I think it's that's fair enough. It's much more rare the case that the first mover maintains first mover than that they don't. So, do we? Does one of you want to, or somebody else want to explain um, the word network effects gets bandied about a lot? Does the, somebody want to take a crack? Network or, effect or? is where every new user or customer adds value to all the existing users or customers. It's typically, so the means, value of the network increases yeah. as you add the number of nodes. <laughs> So, and, and, and arguably, though, even that is not necessarily defensible because there were, you know, social networks before Facebook, and, which yeah, arguably that have thing, network that's effects. That's the example that always gets brought up, but I, I think Friendster and MySpace both yeah. dropped the ball. So that's why I was careful to put that yeah, qualifier in there. Part of that was timing. Facebook yeah, well, we'll, has not dropped the ball. We'll <laughs> a part of that was timing on infrastructure in Friendster's case, right? I think Facebook was started maybe a year and a half or two years later. and. Like the infrastructure that was available to Facebook was so different than the infrastructure but that was By the way, Friendster lost Friendster. a MySpace before they lost to Facebook. Yeah, so. but I think it's also part of it is the timing. is like the, the amount of services that are available, even six or 12 months later, makes a huge difference. I mean, it, in this space alone, we, we were seed investors in Skype and Broadsoft. Neither of them were first. They both ended up winning the consumer VoIP space and the enterprise VoIP space at billion-dollar-plus exits. Uh, there's... Fast follower precedent is an issue. I think it's much more of an issue in the consumer space than it is in the enterprise space. Um, and I think net, all these trends, we try to you know, represent them as balance. They're overwhelmingly positive for you as entrepreneurs largely here in this room, which is the cost has come massively down. Yes, the hurdle to get funding is higher, but the reality is your biggest issue is opportunity cost of your time. That's the asset. And if you don't, if your business isn't working, you should drop it. An investor shouldn't be the driver of whether or not it makes sense and move on to the next thing. And so the fact that for very little capital, you can get very quick market feedback and figure out does this thing make sense or not and move on to the next things. And all of our portfolio companies would probably love to hire the vast majority of people in this room if you're not going to go off and do your, your own thing. And so you have plenty of alternatives. And the fact that you can get that feedback very quickly and build on top of these infrastructure layers that are very low cost and focus, I mean, uh, run wild if you want to do the next storage or compute environment, but the fact is, if you do these platform or application layers, there's a lot of white space out there to go out and build really big companies. So I, I think as an investor or as an entrepreneur, like the things that differentiate are, one, are, do you have customers and are they paying? Because um, it's much easier, I think, to hold on to market position or define market position if you've got paying customers than if you just have a free service that people are using. Um, you know, when GroupMe got going, I think the analysis a lot of us had was, gee, that's an interesting free service that they're paying for, <laughs> but their customers are not. <laughs> so we were sort of wondering, like, if that's, you know, uh, I, I don't know that that's a negative for them. They eventually, like, found somebody who was willing to buy them. But in general, you know, if a company's paying for a service that they're not charging for, that's a real negative. Um, if they're not paying much for something that they're not charging for, that's maybe something to look at. But if they're not paying much for something and they're charging for it, that's a great scenario. I mean, even if there is competition, you can probably figure out a strategy to retain some of those customers and grow the business. So uh, I would say stitching together uh, code from oh, platforms to... Wait, wait a second. I, I wanted to push back on that a little bit. What if you're charging your customers for something that the next business, the fast follower that launches, decides that they can give that part away for free? Sure. I mean, that's something you'll have to figure out whether, you know, again, is your service differentiated enough that you can continue to charge for it if someone gives it away for free. But that's really the test case. I mean, I, yeah. I, as much as there are lots of great free services out there, I have a preference for revenue and preference for, you know, business models where the customers are paying you, not advertising based or free. Uh, we certainly do invest in, in free and freemium services, but it's probably the exception, not the rule for what we're doing. I will say that, uh, like, there's a temptation to give things away for free or there's a temptation to just kind of tinker at the edges and find exactly what customers want at the application stack. I wouldn't overlook the role of technology development. There's still a lot of technical problems to be solved. There's still a lot of technology to be built. 
And there are very difficult things you can do on the back end that will really improve the user experience on the front end. I think Instagram now is well known for doing that fast background image uploading and that snappy interface. Um, that's in the, you know, Google, they did a lot of technology in the back end to create a very simple front end for you. And uh, you know, if you have hardcore developers on your team, that can end up being a fundamental advantage if you can use technology to solve a real user problem. Don't just feel the need to stitch together a bunch of APIs. In fact, I would say that's what Twilio's competitive advantage was in my mind. I know that you know, Jeff and the rest of the team were really technically advanced and certainly there is a lot of you know, defensible IP of what they built, but really what I thought was the most significant advantage was the fact that their user docs, uh, or the, sort of their developer docs and APIs and everything were extremely simple and friendly to understand. And so there were, and still are, Twilio competitors out there. Twilio is much more fun to use, much easier to be able to read and understand quickly. It's strange to say that, you know, your simplicity of your API is your competitive advantage, um, but the ability to explain and make something complex simple is, in Twitter's case. So we're, we're going to open it up for questions in just a second. Um, uh, but I wanted to just throw out, is there a, a type of cloud service, either on the consumer side or on the more infrastructure side, that you can't believe doesn't exist or something you, you'd be currently looking for? You go, this is such a great opportunity. Why isn't anybody doing this? I don't think investors should be coming with business ideas, frankly. <laughs> the history of that is quite poor. But if I had to, I would say the most interesting companies to me today are the ones that are uh, marrying real-world logistics to uh, the web and mobile. So it's everything in the Uber, Lyft, Postmates, exec kind of domain, where you're taking things, or Mechanical Turk, Crowdflower, you take things that are like real-world actions and activities that require a lot of meat space touching and hand-holding, and then you kind of make them available through thin APIs, uh, or you, you make them into beautiful consumer experiences. What I haven't seen, I haven't seen enough there on the infrastructure side. So Amazon played with it as shipping and warehousing as a service. So they do that where they'll warehouse certain merchant stuff and ship it. I think there's a lot more to be done there, which is building logistical infrastructure companies that then actually provide services to other companies. What would FedEx look like today if you built it from the ground up to be expressed through APIs and, and mobile phones? rather than through lots of paper and envelopes. So on, th on that point, like one of the issues in us not investing internationally in some places is physical delivery to the curb. Uh, so I think we take for granted in the US that everything, every address is addressable by a carrier. Uh, that's not the case in Latin America and in South Asia and in much of Asia. Even in, uh, in some parts of Europe, it's not easy to get to the address or there's not a confirmable delivery person to the address. And so physical delivery to the curb and payment are two of the stopping blocks right now for getting services to work. Like any type of physical delivery commerce service right now in the US is copycatable in other places. But a lot of times uh, the audience may only have anywhere from 10 to 30% penetration on either credit card or a financial instrument. And there may be like 0% <laughs> penetration on confirmable physical address and delivery, although people start to hack it with delivery and SMS and COD. Yeah, just uh, one thought to add there. We try to think through sector areas just because cloud is such a large space that trying to have some hypotheses on themes uh, we think is, is helpful. And one of the themes that we've called out in a, in a road mapping process is this whole notion of developer citizenry. And it's empowered Sorry. developer citizenry which is this idea that developer is the customer within an organization. And we see it through a lot of these services we've been talking about, but we think we're just scratching the surface there as you have this explosion of the platform as a service layer. And the good news there is, in many cases, you are the, the customer and potentially the entrepreneur, which uh, it's like Tom Siebel you know, conceiving. Uh, Siebel long ago uh, was this idea that you know, Siebel actually was a new software and cutting edge uh, long ago when it was conceived, and as the sales professional, he could envision what the product would be like. Similarly, uh, as consumers of developer tools and technologies, your relative power within your organization is going up dramatically. And the whole notion of the IT shop running an RFP process and buying tech uh, is thrown out the window. And Twilio has example after example of, of projects being commissioned where a developer will walk into the kickoff meeting and have built the thing that they have six months of planning meetings scheduled you know, to discuss. Just saying, look, you know, I, I pulled it together, I built it. And 
So it, it makes you the buyer and it makes you potentially the entrepreneur around ideas that are relevant to you because we're finding that the, the developer markets are massive um, and they are reachable, which historically hadn't been the case. Um, I think, again, I, I don't come up with the ideas, but I think what I've been looking for generally is kind of similar to what these guys are talking about. I, I call it life 2.0. Like it's, we're in such an amazing, amazing phase because of cloud services like Twilio and Heroku and AWS that you can now relook at everything that you do in your personal life and in your work life. And if anything, if there's inefficiency, if there are things that are boring, if there are things that haven't been reinvented in a long time, I think from like when you wake up in the morning to how you eat your breakfast to what you do at work and how you communicate with people, whether it's what a meeting is like or how a memo is written, how you get your lunch, how you book your personal services, how you get ready for your date night. Like everything is actually in process of being reinvented by these new technology products and services. And I think everything's kind of moving to a services orientation where these things should be on demand. And, and so that might mean the sharing economy. That means a lot of more transparency and yield management. It means a move to dynamic pricing for a lot of things that are currently fixed pricing. I think there's a ton of new services that are going to be developed that are going to make life so much more fun, more efficient, and more cost effective in a lot of places. And many wonderful more ways of wasting time, too. Yeah, um, yeah. All right, with that, we're going to open it for questions. And uh, since we have the mix up here, I'm going to go repeat the questions so that people can hear them. But you have to speak loud enough so I can hear you. Uh, yep. All right, the question is, can we give concrete examples of uh, defensible barriers in the B2B space, correct? Does anybody want to take a crack at that? I, I have something on that as well. So you're going you're gonna to hate this answer, but the defensible best practice in B2B, in my opinion, is a great sales process, which most engineers forget about. Um, the kind of fucked up thing is when you're selling to a business, uh, a lot of the product differentiation and benefits may be secondary to how good the sales process and person is. Uh, <laughs> and that's one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of it, but the reality is uh, if you have good salespeople and a great sales process, you can possibly get a passable or shitty product over the, over the water. So and if you have a crappy sales process, a good product might not get there. So it, I think you're missing the biggest part of B2B, which when you said that you're not interested in the freemium models, because that's what's turning the B2B market on its head. And that's why we're running wild in enterprise B2B right now, because you've got this lower friction sales cycle, which doesn't need the gold chain wearing sales guy to push crappy product because he's got a relationship and the product sells itself into I, I the department. I think that's still the case though. I mean, it may be better now because you can do some things freemium. But before, the product is your sales team in this case. You, you, you can get, get it into the department, well, you, it's free, the, the use it if you like. Right, right, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna, right. This is absolutely yes, essential. No, no, the difference no, I, is yeah. you can afford to give away the product for trial usage. But if you're still gonna charge a B2B price that's $25,000 a year or more, or $5,000 a month so or I, more, I, you're gonna be out of credit card and expense process into negotiated life cycle and process, and that's gonna require good sales. It doesn't matter, you we, might get We have that. many enterprise, <laughs> Box has six figure customers up and down that they've never met, or that have never had a, a rep go there. You look at Cornerstone On Demand or Eloqua. I don't think that's the typical, you're not gonna get people like close on like high belt, like six it, figure. In many cases, you're right, but just the importance of cases, sales in the process, in cases, but would you, would you admit that the importance of sales as a relative basis has gone way down? Way down. How, how, many, how many people, how many people? All right, all right, all right. How many people on the panel think it's going to end up How many up people here use Yammer? How many people have paid for Yammer? <laughs> if no, right, so it, it spreads. It's viral. You use it. Small companies use it. You don't actually pay for it, but bigger companies pay for it. I think Yammer is a great example. But, but I, I, I yes, wanted to actually try to address this. Yes, but you still have to close with someone, <laughs> and someone's still going to need to try to a six or seven figure deal, and you still need <laughs> to have a good salesperson <laughs> to get that deal closed. You can get trial usage because it's cheaper to give away, but you still have a negotiated sales process if the figure's above a certain amount that gets you into bureaucracy, and if you have a shitty salesperson or no salesperson, you will not sell the product. And that's like the engineering like thing that happens is people forget that sales is important, and if you're going consumer, it's less important. If you're going to enterprise, it's way more important, and it's only recently got a little bit better. So I think we're going to have, this is going to stay a disagreement on the panel here, which is good. I, I think the answer not to your question resolved. is Java. Java is a defensible um, barrier. But, but, I, 
But I, I did want to come back and say, I think from, from our perspective anyhow, it does come back to network effects. So if you think of the first generation of software as a service business, the first generation of software as a service businesses basically were providing features instead of on-premise over the wire, over the internet. And they were saying, we're keeping your data strictly separate from everybody else's. Because they had to say that in order just to convince people that it was OK not to run this on-premise. The next generation of software as a service companies will actually say, no, no, we are commingling your data, and it's good for you. And that's how they're building a network. And so they're going to basically ask people to come and join and be together um, on the same platform. So that could be procurement. Instead of the charging for the features of the procurement service, we're now seeing the next generation that actually pools the purchasing power of the businesses that are on the platform. And that becomes a defensible advantage. Ooh, boy, I think we have time for one more question. All right. Yep, you. <laughs> Uh, can, can so just, to repeat, I think uh, patents is worth it or not? patents are yeah. patents worth it for startups? Yes yeah. or no? His, historically, patents have been a waste of time, and I personally That's find them point. morally reprehensible. That said, they seem to be gaining in popularity after Google paid twelve and a half billion for Motorola, and Samsung sued the and Apple are suing each other, and now they, we've moved to a first to file system, which is also a little annoying, um, which actually makes a lot of the current problems worse. So more and more people are doing it. I've still never been a startup where I've gotten real value out of it because even if you do have a patent that people are violating, what are you going to do? Are you going to go sue them and spend the next two years of your life in court? So it's, it's probably not worth doing for investors or at least savvy investors. And frankly, it's not worth doing unless you truly have a fundamental breakthrough. And people will tell you when you do. It's not when you think you do because you always think you do. Yeah, very little value for offensive benefit, uh, potentially modest for defensive. Offensive benefit in terms of market insights, those sorts of things. That's why you bring on people like this on your board and, and try to get them on early because you can get money from anyone. But part of the insight is market navigation. What else is happening in the market? Where's the white space? Because your business isn't going to end where it starts. You know That's a given. And so getting some notion of smart money, and Twilio did a heck of a job assembling at least the other four here, uh, of people that are extremely value add in that process. That's where sort of the offensive market dynamics and, and things like patents hopefully are totally irrelevant, at least in the medium term of your business. I think there's, there's potential modest value to filing provisional patents if you're not spending a lot of time or money on that. Um, the guy who actually did the work for Twilio, Jeff Schox, uh, S-C-H-O-X, uh, he's a former programmer. He teaches at Stanford. I think he's got his shit together. Um, I don't know if he scales or whether those other people like him. Uh, I generally do not make recommendations for lawyers, so that's a rarity <laughs> for me. Pat patent lawyers particularly. Um, but I would try and find somebody who think is rational and objective. Uh, that's usually not the person you're going to be paying to do the work. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, provisional patents at best. Do them quickly. Don't spend a lot of money on them. All right. Unfortunately, we have to wrap this up. Um, thank you all, and thanks to the panelists for coming here.